also seen um, in WTO rulings a rolling back of uh, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, it, it really is an opportunity for corporations to go in and just um, you know take away all of the things that we've fought really hard for. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I am your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Elizabeth Swagger. She is the Assistant Director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Uh, when I first met her in 2008, she was working on the Sweat Free Portland campaign, which resulted in the City of Portland enacting a sweat free procurement policy. So, welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you very much, David. Very good. Yeah. So. Tell us a little bit about the sweat-free uh, procurement policy and what that was and how we got it. Yeah, okay. So as you mentioned before, I joined Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. I worked for an anti-sweatshop campaign. Um, and we were actually the first city in uh, the Northwest to pass a sweat-free purchasing policy. And what that meant is that uniforms for police, for firefighters, and other public employees uh, were purchased from um, sources that did not use sweatshops. So ensuring that um, the factories where these were made, uh, factory workers were not forced to work overtime, uh, factory workers were paid a uh, living wage, um, and uh, you know, so much of um, our clothing is made under uh, really treacherous conditions. Um, and I think it ties in well to the work that I do now with um, you know, fighting for mm -hmm. free trade agreements to try and ensure that um, working conditions uh, with the uh, countries that we have these trade policies with are improved rather than, um, rather than they being tools to for corporations to uh, seek out the cheapest labor right. and in countries with exploitive conditions. Right. Yeah, and, and do we have any way, uh, are you still connected to that uh, sweat free campaign? Uh, I'm still uh, on the oversight committee and uh, I meet with the city purchasing department um, quarterly uh, to go over the different uh, contracts that we have. Oh, so okay. um, they've done a great job. Um, they've actually been a leader in the country in, um, you know, in o overseeing uh, these purchases and uh, have participated in um, a database that, uh, that nationwide is being created uh, as a resource for yeah. cities that have passed these policies. Great, yeah. And you probably don't know this, but prior to my recent retirement, I worked for a public agency, not the city of Portland, and I was in the procurement department. So I used to go to uh, meetings that procurement officials from around the state, or in a couple of cases, I went to a couple of national conferences. And at those conferences, the purchasing manager at from the city of Portland would go to those conferences and talk about this uh, uh, policy and would help uh, other cities um, figure out how to do it themselves. So it really is, I mean, it's like uh, sometimes we engage in these campaigns, we wonder what the, what the results are. But here we did have a city official here in Portland who went nationally claiming ownership uh, and promoting the policy. So that was really, really good. So thank you for your work on that. Oh, thank you for right. your work on that too. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, so uh, you have been the assistant director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign for about a year? That's right. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Sure. Um, so Oregon Fair Trade Campaign is a statewide coalition. Um, it's mostly labor uh, and human rights groups that work on fighting uh, NAFTA style free trade agreements. Um, at the same time, we work hard to promote a positive vision of international trade, which would include trade uh, that has strong enforceable labor standards and that works to protect the environment. Um, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, we're seeing just the opposite with uh, past free trade agreements. Um, so we work hard to reform those trade deals. Okay. And so s just give us a list of some of those past trade agreements so we all kind of know what we're talking about. Sure. Um, I think I would start with NAFTA. Um, it's the North American Free Trade Agreement. Um, it was passed in 1994. 
and it's really served as a, a model for all other trade deals since then. Um, the way that it was promoted is that this is going to be a tool to increase uh, U.S. exports. Um, it's going to increase jobs. Um, it's uh, going to ensure that uh, our environmental policies uh, are upheld, and really what we saw was everything was the opposite. Um, so after NAFTA passed in 1994, um, since then we've seen 2.5 million trade-related job losses, and that's certified by the U.S. Um, uh, Labor Commission. So, okay. um, so you know, emphasize, how many jobs? 2.5 million. Job losses. Job losses right. related okay. to trade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the actual number is likely to be much, much higher because those are jobs that um, uh, ha have been certified. They're jobs that um, people have applied for trade adjustment assistance, um, which is this. Um, it, which is a tool that the government uses to be able to give people a little bit of resources um, and some retraining uh, to get them back into the field. Um, but not everyone applies for that. So the likely number is uh, something closer to 3.5 million. Yeah, okay. Do, do, you, do you have any sense of, um, uh, of this assistance? Uh, I know a lot of that assistance went to retraining uh, workers to do other kinds of jobs, and, and I have in my mind uh, a lot of work is going to refrigeration school uh, to learn refrigeration. And it just it seems like um, that that must have created such a glut of refrigeration uh, workers that uh, they couldn't have get, gotten all jobs. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that really is an excellent point, and you know. It, I think that begs uh, begs us to look at you know does it really just affect the people who lost jobs? I mean certainly the the loss of livelihoods affects them and their their families, but you also have this uh, growing pool of unemployed, um, which puts real downward pressure on wages and uh, benefits for the jobs uh, that are still here. Mm -hmm. um, not only that, it of course, with less less people out in the labor market, less people working, there's less people paying taxes, which creates um, you know a loss of revenue for local governments, cutting um, you know money funding to schools, cutting funding to libraries, and other important um, public resources. Yeah, right, right, like like police and fire. That's Could right. Be another, you know, or water services. Uh, just just uh, such a long list. Of, of things that get cut as a result of this. So, okay, good. So uh, we had NAFTA, what else do we have? So NAFTA, like I said, served as a model for the following free trade agreements. The most recent um, that just passed last year was uh, the Korea, Colombia, and um, Panama free trade agreements. Okay. And um, just to give you a sense of what those trade deals mean for, for people. Um, the Colombia Free Trade Agreement uh, was particularly devastating because um, Colombia has the uh, largest number of uh, trade, um, trade leader assassinations in the world. So you have a situation where corporations can use this uh, free trade agreement as uh, a tool to go to uh, labor pools where people cannot organize without fear for their lives. Um, the Panama Free Trade Agreement is with a country um, where it's known a known tax haven, um, so it allows more and more corporations to get away with without paying taxes um, for firefighters, libraries, and all of the things that we've talked about. Um, the K South Korea free trade agreement with the U.S. Um, South Korea uh, well has a, a healthy, strong economy. Um, they have uh, a great auto industry. Um, what we see there is uh, a country that, um, you know, that uh, is 
more likely um, to be able to challenge our laws as investors. Um, uh, the free trade agreement with Korea and um, with NAFTA uh, have chapters on um, investor rights, and it allows them to uh, go and um, challenge our environmental laws if they see it as an impediment to them um, reaching f future profits. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, that can have devastating results on our, inv our environmental protections. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, so it, and it works both ways because obviously, um, it actually, except for Korea, in most cases, it's American companies which are you know, investing in, in other countries that have these. And so it's American companies which are challenging laws, environmental laws or health care laws or so forth in third world countries. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a downward push in both directions. And that's absolutely right. And we've seen, um, we've seen cases of this already where you have um, corporations challenging uh, El Salvador's mining laws and um, uh, challenging Peru's clean air laws. Um, it's already happening, so uh, we're going to see a whole lot more of that. Right, yeah. And I think the, the El Salvador case is really interesting because uh, they're, part of, they're part of CAFTA. But the one of the companies that was challenging their uh, their environmental laws regarding mining was actually a Canadian company, and the Canadian company did not have a a, a trade agreement with with uh, El Salvador, so they formed a division in the United States, so then they could use the the CAFTA agreement in order to challenge that law. So it's uh, it's a very slippery slope. And it actually demonstrates something else, I think, with regard to South Korea, in that um, one of the things, my understanding, one of the, one of the one of the major American sectors that was interested in the South Korea agreement was our financial sector, and they wanted to be able to invest uh, and open branches in South Korea. Um, but the effect of that would be that then those branches. If they then reinvest back into the United States, which they very well could, uh, then could challenge our financial services industry laws and regulations. Uh, so this is a, a backward, a backdoor way for our companies to challenge our own laws, even though our laws don't allow them to do that. That's right. That's right. And it's particularly scary um, coming, you know with the economic crisis that we're facing, um, not being able to set up and establish financial regulations to protect from the next round. And mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that's a, a very, very serious threat that uh, is people are starting to wake up to. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. right, yeah. And, and so uh, let, let's talk about this new agreement that President Obama is negotiating. It'll be his first agreement, uh, should he be successful. Yeah, what's it called and tell us some details about that. So uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is uh, currently being negotiated between nine countries in the Pacific Rim, um, including the U.S., uh, Australia, New Zealand, Brunei, Vietnam, um, Singapore, Malaysia, Peru, and Chile. Um, this is already uh, the largest trade deal that the U.S. Uh, has ever been party to. Canada and uh, Mexico are going to be joining the next round of negotiations um, taking place in New Zealand. So some are already calling this uh, NAFTA on steroids. Um, beyond uh, it being a massive trade deal in terms of um, size and, and uh, the implications of it. Um, it's also one of the most secretive trade negotiations to date. Um, people like you and I, journalists, uh, are barred from knowing what's uh, being negotiated in our names. However, 600 corporate lobbyists not only have access to the negotiating text, they also have the ear of the negotiators. Um, so while um, 
you know, you and I who are most affected by it, farmers, family, for, uh, family farmers, um, you know, uh, people uh, who need to be able to access affordable medication, um, you know, everyone who, uh, who is most affected is locked out while there's uh, corporations that are, you know, really um, being able to put their input in behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. And how many negotiating sessions have they had? Uh, this last one in Leesburg, Virginia, was the 14th round of 14th, negotiations. 14th, 14th round. And so how long have they been negotiating this? A couple of years? Yes, it's been uh, two, three years. So a couple, couple, three year, couple, three years that we have all been locked out of knowing uh, what's going to be in this negotiation. But uh, luckily for us, there have been a couple of chapters that have been leaked. So we do have an idea. Can, can you give us some idea what's been leaked? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the leaked chapters um, have been focused on intellectual property rights and investor to state um, rights. So, so this investor to state rights is what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, but uh, uh, investors being able to challenge uh, uh, national or state local laws. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so, looking at um, looking at how the IP chapter would affect us, uh, the intellectual property rights okay. chapter, um, that one's particularly significant because um, it threatens our access to affordable medication. So, uh, a lot of um, industry lobbyists are hoping to be able to. Uh, get some language to extend the life of drug patents. Um, and that's beyond 20 years, which is which it currently is at. Um, so the impact that that will have on um, people in um, some of the poorer nations, uh, people who are, uh, are facing life-threatening diseases like HIV and malaria, um, you know, this is essentially a death sentence um, for, um, you know, for the other chapter, what that's going to mean, um, the chapter looking at investor rights, uh, we're looking at, um, you know, corporations, foreign companies being able to challenge our um, mining laws, our um, forest laws, um, and the impact that it'll have on our environment will be really devastating. Okay. And some of these company, excuse, some of these countries, uh, Australia, uh, Japan. Did you say Japan was part of it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and you said Canada is going to be uh, do make significant investments in the United States. So they, you know, it, the effect on us for a country like Vietnam uh, is not going to be great uh, because they don't invest in the United States. Uh, they're just too poor. I mean, they're looking for our investments, but. Australia, Japan, uh, and uh, Canada certainly do make investments here. So we could see them challenging our laws. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And just to um, give a little more clarity, Japan uh, is not joining the next round, but they're interested in joining, so oh, that okay. is still in debate. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's close enough. They're going to they're gonna get involved. Most likely, oh, right. most okay. likely. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I think that um, I think that's absolutely right. That um, you know, these these are countries that uh, have healthy, vital economies, and their ability to um, be able to challenge our laws is much, much greater than uh, some of the countries that we have had uh, bilateral trade agreements right. with. Mm -hmm. um, in those cases, it's generally been the opposite, where we have uh, U.S. corporations challenging their mm -hmm. laws. Um, and unfortunately, pretty successfully winning. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, in the WTO, we just in the past year, we've had a couple of decisions from WTO tribunals against uh, uh, American regulations. What one was regarding uh, tuna. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Mm. We've also seen um, in WTO o rulings a rolling back of. Uh, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, it, it really is an opportunity for corporations to go in and just, um, you know, take away all of the things that we've fought really hard for. Um, 
Uh, yeah, okay. Um, let's go back to the transparency, secrecy uh, thing. I think what's most, one of the things that's most disturbing about that is that even our elected officials have not, who should have oversight of these things, uh, have not been able to get access to them. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's not only uh, journalists and the general public that are locked out, it's also our congressional leaders. Um, and you know, this is a, a change in the way that things have been done. Um, with the uh, free trade agreement of the Americas, it was much more transparent. Um, and this is really rolling it back to, um, you know, sealing it off and, uh, and, and it's really an erosion of democracy. Um, we uh, have reached out to uh, Senator Ron Wyden on this particular issue on transparency. Um, and he's become, um, he's become a champion for uh, pushing for more transparency and better uh, congressional oversight as well as more public oversight. Um, which I think is a really important role for him to play. He uh, is the chairman of the um, Senate subcommittee that oversees international trade policy. Um, so for him to be barred uh, from seeing what's being negotiated, uh, is I think it's really revealing as to mm -hmm. uh, what an attack on democracy this is. Um, since uh, he's been advocating for more transparency, he has been allowed to um, see the negotiations. However, he cannot uh, bring his staff. Uh, he can not have a cell phone or pen and paper. It's just him alone in a small room, uh -huh. and uh, it kind of illustrates, you know, uh, yeah. the it, limits. On yeah, and then is he able to communicate what he might have learned while he's? No, 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 that's all. Right, yeah. So, so we are still in the dark, even though we may have someone who is at least allowed into a locked room without a te without paper, pen, pencil, uh, cameras, um, or or any other recording devices. Um, so, anything he might have learned there, he still can't communicate to us. That's right. right. Okay. That's right. Right. Yes. Well, you know, one of the hallmarks, as you know, one of the hallmarks of democracy is that the government is transparent. And so this is, you know, this is a clear, clear violation of one of the most foundational um, aspects for uh, for our democracy is that we get to know what's going on. I think right. that's absolutely okay. right. And yeah. um, uh, since Senator Wyden has spoken out, uh, we've also had 130 uh, congressional leaders sign on to a letter. Um, to the U.S. Trade Representative Ron Kirk, asking for greater transparency and public oversight on the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership negotiations. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think that that is, an, is a testament to the good work that uh, fair trade advocates around the country are doing. Uh, you know, going out and meeting with their elected officials, um, you know, bird dogging. Um, doing uh, educational events and, uh, you know, really showing that these free trade agreements um, are disastrous for workers and for our communities and, you know, uh, getting our elected officials um, to speak on our behalf. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Uh, so there is some consciousness out there, at least among elected officials, that this is going on and, and they need to be uh, raising voices in protest. Right. Okay. That's great. Right. Yeah. So there's um, Senator Sherrod Brown. I think he's from Ohio. Introduced a new bill into Congress called the 21st Century Trade and Market Access Act. Can you tell us anything about that? Sure. Um, this is a, another uh, tool that uh, it's, it's very similar to the Trade Act. So we're not looking at just um, you know what what it is that. Um, you know, is wrong with these trade deals. We're also looking at what we want out of trade policy. Um, this is a, a bill that calls for greater transparency. Um, and we really do believe that it, with public insight, um, you can get a better trade policy. Um, so this bill also looks at, uh, requires um, 
uh, study done t to markets and make sure that um, that you know, this trade deal is something that will actually benefit uh, markets in, in all countries that are involved. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Now, we have just three minutes left, and I've got to, I've got to take part of that. Uh, there is an online petition. You want to t tell us about the online petition? Yes. Um, so, Avaz is, uh, is doing an online petition um, calling to f stop the TPP. And this is an international petition, so people from all over the world are uh, signing, uh, signing this petition, asking for um, a stop to any trade policy uh, that is going to harm the environment uh, and public interest. So uh, you can go to our tiny URL, um, and uh, that is uh, tiny.cc um, forward slash stop TPP. Great. Okay. Thank you very much for being here, Elizabeth. Thank you, David. Okay, good. All right. So we've been talking with Elizabeth Swagger, who is the assistant director of the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign. Um, she just uh, talked about the petition online, so I do want to reemphasize that. We do encourage you to go and sign the petition. Um, they're striving to get a million signatures on this. The last I checked, they were at about 230. A thousand. So the the URL is tiny.cc backslash stop TPP. Uh, for additional uh, information uh, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you can also go to the Citizens Trade Campaign website at citizenstrade.org. You can go to the Oregon Fair Trade Campaign at oregonfairtrade.org. And Public Citizen has a lot of information on both this both this agreement proposed agreement and past agreements, uh, uh, citizen.org, click on Eyes on Trade. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Populist Dialogues is now on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view our, all our shows and to subscribe. Mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. To learn more, visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or a Portland website at afd pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today for being here, Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Dave King, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, our audience, for watching. We hope that you'll tune in again next week. Bye. Oregon Measure 84 creates more tax loopholes for the wealthy top 2%. Don't they get enough already? Millionaires can pay taxes. Vote no. Oregon Measure 84.